My sermon this morning is not centered on a central text, but on a central theme that runs throughout the entire Bible. That what we know, what we've been taught, is a cause for thanksgiving and is worth remembering. If there was a main text for this sermon, it might be Colossians 2, verses 6 through 7, which reads this way. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Katie, Grace, and I have feasted on homemade dinners for two weeks now, made by you. And we've received cards and loving texts. Three of our shepherds stopped by just to hug our necks. Grace had her first ever sleepover with some honorary grandparents who are members of this congregation. When Katie was most in need of something to bring her some joy and happiness, four of our close friends here came over to our house, broke in, and cleaned it. Brought tears to my wife's eyes. The love has been so overwhelming, I couldn't help but share it. And one of my former colleagues and friends at Harding responded with the best line. I love it, he said, when the church is the church. Amen. In the words of the Apostle Paul to his friend Philemon, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love of, of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Sometimes I'm forced to remind myself what it is that I do here every Sunday morning. One of my favorite practitioners of this trade once said that a preacher learns the song in your heart and then sings it back to you when you forget how it goes. And there are times in your life when the song in your heart is a waltz because the heavens are just pouring down happiness and all you can do is dance in the rain. There are times that you never want to forget. Times you wish would last forever. And then there are days and long sleepless nights when the song in your heart is an old country ballad as you recount all the things you've lost. Those are times that you want to forget. And in those moments, you come to church to be reminded that God feels your loss, but that loss is not the end of your story. And sometimes the song that needs to be sung by way of reminder is the song playing in my own heart. Katie and I experienced a Thanksgiving that we will never forget. As most of you know, Katie's father and my friend and father-in-law, Dave, went to the ER complaining of back pain. And less than 48 hours later, the doctors called the family to his bedside to say their last goodbyes. And Katie and I were unable to make the trip to Indiana, so we watched the funeral on our bed on a Saturday morning. And just 12 hours later, early on the first day of the week, when God breathes fresh new life into the world, Katie gave birth to the most beautiful baby boy you've ever laid eyes on. Henry David Anthony Guy graced the world on November 19, and our world will never be the same. Katie's mom had so much to take care of, as you can imagine. But on Thursday, Thanksgiving Day, she got up early and braved the roads and made the 10-hour drive to reunite with Katie, to hug her granddaughter Grace, and to hold for the first time 
her new grandson in her arms. And there are moments in our lives where we don't know what to say, but we know that we'll never forget. 160 years ago, President Abraham Lincoln had to imagine what to say to a war-torn country struggling with the loss of life. And in the summer of 1863, Lincoln received a very short letter. It seemed that the renowned speaker, Edward Everett, was going to be giving a speech at Gettysburg, a memorial. His speech was going to be the main event. Everett had been a representative, a senator, the governor of Massachusetts, a vice presidential candidate, and now he was serving as president of Harvard. The speaker was set. The date was set. I remember the date because it holds a special place in my heart. November 19. And in this short letter, almost as an afterthought, Lincoln was asked to maybe give a few words to commemorate the ground. And when the day arrived, Everett spoke for several hours, Lincoln for just three minutes. But it's his speech that we all remember. You know the one. The one that begins four score and seven years ago. And in the third paragraph of that short speech, on that chilly afternoon on November 19, Lincoln said, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it will never forget what they did here. Never forget. It's a phrase used in most Holocaust memorials. It speaks to the sense deep in our consciousness, deep in our psyche, that we think there's something worse than death, and that's to be forgotten. In the 49th chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah is reflecting on the incredible loss that Israel is about to experience. Because God's going to bring his own people into captivity. And the chapter abounds with God's reassurance that even though they may experience days or even years of sadness, he's going to bring them back. There's always hope in his stories. But the people are having a hard time believing it. And as you read through the chapter, you see a mixture of joy and sadness, hope and despair. For example, the Lord's going to delight in his people, says Isaiah. But in verse 14, Zion says to the Lord, you've forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Have you ever had a moment in your life when you felt like everything you've worked for, everything that you thought you were, was going to be lost, and everything about you would be forgotten? In Washington, D.C. stands a Vietnam veterans memorial wall. It was completed in 1982. A young Yale University student designed the wall for an extra credit project in class. It starts as a small triangle on both sides in the corners, standing only eight inches tall. As you walk along, the wall rises to 250 feet, uh, 250 feet long and meets in the middle at 10 feet tall. And etched in stone in the granite, are 55,185 names. It's a reflecting wall, not just to reflect the names of those who died, but to reflect the face of those who came to stand. Most of us go looking for the names of our loved ones that we knew, and when we're done, we follow our curiosity to find anyone who bears our name. And this is where the design of the wall really comes to the fore. As you look at the names, you see yourself. You see the common bond that you have with those who have gone before. And in Isaiah 49, 
What hits God like a ton of bricks is to hear his people say, you have forgotten me. And so God responds, can a woman forget her nursing child? That she has no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Your walls are continually before me, and I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. You know, writing on the palms of your hands goes away. Any schoolboy who's tried to cheat that way knows that for sure, or, or so I've heard. But engraving is permanent. God engraves memories in the palms of his hands. Maybe you remember a story in John chapter 20. Jesus appears in the middle of a room where the apostles are reflecting on the loss of their Lord. And then the risen Jesus says to Thomas, Take your finger. Put them in the holes in my hands. As if he was saying, I will never forget you for the memory of what I did for you is ever before me, engraved in the palms of my hands. Writing names is a metaphor for knowing that we're in the hands of God who never forgets us. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells his followers, don't rejoice because you're able to cast demons out. Rejoice that your names are inscribed in heaven. In Revelation 21, the picture given to us of the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, is one with a great wall around it, with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels, and on every gate is engraved the names given to the people of God. God doesn't forget. God remembers. In Genesis 8, we find ourselves right in the middle of the flood story. The whole world, it seems, has gone astray, and God has to look all over the place for a people in whom he can find favor. And then we have this gem of a line in Genesis 8 and verse 1. And God remembered Noah. It's the kind of character reference that we need to carry us through the whole Scripture. And it's how we know that we can pray with Habakkuk, O oh Lord, I've heard the report of you in your work and in your wrath. Remember mercy. Then we have Genesis 30. Rachel's been barren. She feels so discounted. She feels her life will mean nothing. That is, until the text gives us the line that we've been waiting for. God remembered Rachel. He listened to her. And he opened her womb. We barely begin reading Exodus before the people of God give a collective cry of despair and oppression, stuck in Egypt, in the grip of the hands of Pharaoh, without a prayer, it seemed. But God heard their cry, and he remembered the covenant that he had made with their fathers. It's this striking language of remembrance that flows from the mouth of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, as he pours forth praise at the specter of hope arising in his own day. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. My God does not forget the good stuff. When it comes to you, the difference that you make, the kind of person that he's called you to be, and by his spirit you have become. 
my God does not forget. He remembers you. And he wants us to remember him. As the children of Israel prepared to leave the grip of Pharaoh, God gave his people a meal, a covenant meal to remember. And on the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread and the cup of that covenant meal. And he told his disciples, this is my body. This is my blood. Do this and remember me. There's a reason that God in the Old Testament and the Son of God in the New Testament chose a meal by way of reminder. Because it's something that we do every day. For those of us in the modern world, several times a day. Every time that we feel our hunger, we remember the bread of life. And it's no coincidence that the elements that night were the most simple kind. Bread and wine, something that you would find on every shelf and on every table in that world. It's the same reason that we were made of dust And when we're born again, we're born again as we pass through the water. Dust, water, bread, and wine. The simplest of all elements. The most ordinary things on earth. The things we experience a thousand times. The things we see everywhere we look. So that every day, in every way, we would remember. We'd remember that He has not And we'll never forget us. When we forget how loved we are, how saved we are, how infinitely better life is for us who know Jesus Christ, follow the promise and the advice of the Apostle Paul. Remember that you too were once separated from Christ Aliens from the covenant of promise, with no hope and without God in the world. But God showed his favor and his loving kindness. He remembered his plan of love. And God remembered you. When the messenger from God appeared to Cornelius in a vision, he said, God has heard your prayer and your almsgiving to the poor has come up as a remembrance before God. God knows you, loves you, sees you, watches you, and remembers you. And when you feel as though you are surrounded by nothing but pain and sorrow and loss, hear the stirring words from the apostle to Timothy. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. We are held up, held on, and held forth by a power greater than sin or death or the grave. It was Jonah who in the darkness of the deep declared, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. That's a good thing. Because in the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 11, remember, it is not you who support the root. It is the root that supports you. And when Israel fell again and again, they found a way to return, to start anew. And the psalmist in Psalm 78 puts it this way. They remembered that God was their rock. And so it is that we are at times tempted to forget, but He will not forget. We're prone to lose track of it all, but He will not loosen His gaze upon us. And when we feel helpless and alone, staring face to face with only the tragedy we feel in our lives, when we could only muster up the courage to say what the thief said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
Jesus looks back tenderly at us, to you and me, precious children, living and loving in the light of his grace. And he whispers sweetly to us, I already have. It is finished. Behold, all things are new. And that's why the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It's why His mercies never come to an end. We remember the wormwood and the gall. We remember the bitterness, and we cry out for God to remember us in our affliction. But then we remember this, and in this we find hope. His mercies are new every morning. They must be, because Jesus has declared in His resurrection once and for all, that pain and loss and death will never be the end of the story. The new day has already dawned, and we're living in the light of His coming glory. And that is why every day, in every way, we can say thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle John provides perhaps the most fitting conclusion to our sermon this morning. A sermon about remembering God at work, even in the most difficult days. Remembering that God has not and will not abandon you. Remembering that His goodness is fresh and new every morning. And that even the darkness can be but a passageway into the light. It's in John 16, beginning in verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been brought into the world. So also you will have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. We know the joy of new life. We know that we'll see our dead loved ones again. We know that in Christ, by the power of the Spirit, our hearts can and will rejoice, and no one will take our joy away from us. Can you hear the sweet call of our Savior, the one who was raised from the dead? He's calling out to you begging for you to find joy and life and peace in Him. He stands ready to welcome you if you'll let Him.